Hi, everyone. Happy Thursday and welcome to the ACLU of Pennsylvania's All Membership Webinar. Uh, my name is Sarah Johnson. I use she, her pronouns, and uh, I am fortunate to be the Director of Philanthropy. Uh, it's a, a true pleasure uh, to be in virtual community with you all. I, I know I can't see your faces, but I see the uh, ever-growing participant list and, and I can and certainly feel uh, your presence. Um, you know, this work we do to advance uh, civil liberties takes us all. Um, so I want to thank you for, for being here today. It takes our staff, it takes our volunteers, our clients, community partners, and supporters, you know, who are dedicated to fighting for Pennsylvania that is better for us all. So we app really appreciate uh, all that you do to advance this work. Uh, today, we're going to focus on the, you know, the bedrock of our democracy, voting. Not only is this a, a top priority issue area for our staff here in Pennsylvania, but it's consistently a top interest area for our supporters. Uh, considering the threats we face today and, and very important <laughs> upcoming election, uh, many eyes are paying attention to what's happening in, in Pennsylvania. So joining us to speak on this topic are my talented colleagues and a community partner we lean on in this fight. Um, we have Sarah Mullen. Uh, Advocacy and Policy Director, Marion K. Schneider, Senior Voting Rights Policy Council, uh, Vic Walchek, Legal Director, and our community partner, Joe Sertain, convener at the Ovicado Voter Empower Empowerment Initiative. Excuse me. Um, this group works to increase voter registration and election day turnout among people of color in Pennsylvania. Our conversation today will be moderated by the infamous Andy Hoover, our Director of Communications. A um, few logistics. Uh, shortly, I'll pass the mic over to our executive director, Reggie Shuford, who'll give us a, a brief welcome. We'll then turn it over to our, our, our speakers for 20, 25 minutes. And lastly, of course, we'll open it up for some Q&A. So as, as an FYI, as you can see, we are recorded. Uh, we'll plan on posting it and follow up as well. So please like share the love and uh, the knowledge and guide others in your community uh, towards the session. So with that, I'd like to turn over the mic to Reggie. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Reggie Shu for the executive director, and I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'd like to thank all of our members um, from all over the Commonwealth who are taking their time to join us today. Um, hope you've been enjoying the last few days of, of summer as we make our way into fall. Although with all of these heat waves, it's hard to imagine that fall is really just around the corner. Um, one of the things that's really important to us here at the ACLU of Pennsylvania is increasing the diversity of our organization really in every aspect of the work that we do, and that includes membership, um, because it's important to us that we are always attempting to reflect the world that we live in. Um, with our member calls, uh, there is often a broad range of folks who, who call in, and thank you for that. Um, some of you have been supporting our work for, for many decades, and some of you are, are newer members. Um, but we're delighted to have all of you. Uh, and so because of that, though, we always like to take the first few minutes of these calls to provide a broad overview uh, of our organization and the work that we do, um, especially, again, for those who are newer to the organization. So to that end, the American Civil Liberties Union found, is a national nonpartisan organization founded over 100 years ago. Um, we do not endorse candidates for office. Here in Pennsylvania, we are a staff of roughly 40 with offices in Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Harrisburg, uh, and have over 40,000 members and supporters across the state. Uh, nationwide, the numbers are approximately, approximately 1.75 million members. Our priority areas are decarceration, police reform, and voting rights, today's uh, subject. Although 70 to 80% of our work will be geared towards these top priority issues that I just mentioned, the rest of our time is designed for us to remain nimble, to be able to respond to other emerging threats like repro rights and LGBTQ and T equality. All of our work um, encodes abide, which is authentic belonging, inclusion, diversity and equity and racial justice. So. That said, thanks to all of you again for participating in today's important discussion. I'll turn it back over to Sarah to help us get started. Thank you, Reggie. Um, now to our call today. Um, in a few minutes or moments, you'll hear uh, 
the, the work we and, and community partners are doing to defend the right to vote. Um, if we learned anything from 2020, is that we need to be prepared for any and every situation to make sure that we all have access to the ballot box. Um, it's never too early to start. Pennsylvania is a critical state, especially with the important gubernatorial and Senate races coming up. Um, our work doesn't stop there, though. As we believe our work will only increase as we approach the 2024 elections. But let's hear from the wonderful speakers uh, working in this arena. Um, Sarah, Marion, Vic, and, and Joe. And as mentioned earlier, our conversation will be moderated by Andy. There he is, I see him. Um, so Andy, with that, I am delighted to turn it over um, and let you take it from here. All right, thanks, Sarah. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your continued support of the organization. We are always appreciative of everything you do to support the ACLU and to ensure that we can carry out this mission. Uh, Sarah, Marion, Vic, Joe, thank you as well for, for being here today and sharing your expertise. So to get our conversation started, I do have a few questions for our panelists, um, and I do want to reemphasize that we will open the floor to your questions for all of you uh, participating in, in, and on this webinar. So you can submit your questions uh, anytime using the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of the Zoom screen um, or the chat. Or if you just want to email, that's also fine. You can email a question to donate at aclupa.org. Um, so to our panelists, um, I'm going to direct some questions to each of you. Um, when you answer for the first time, feel free to introduce yourself as well. Um, share your pronouns uh, and tell us uh, just who you are. So with that being said, uh, Joe, I actually want to start with you. You are the non-ACLU person on this call, so I guess that makes you the guest, and the guest gets to go first. Um, so I want to ask you, you know, that that universal question, just lay it out there about the importance of voting and why people need to be involved. Thank you, Andy. Uh, the, import, the importance of voting in Pennsylvania or in the United States is a, is a, a uh, uh, first of all, a democratic right under the Constitution, but it's something that has been earned and fought for for generations, centuries, I might add, uh, to allow one person one vote in order to be able to select their their leaders in a democracy. Right now, especially in 2022, it's important because democracy is under siege in Pennsylvania and around the country. And uh, with allies and partners like the ACLU, uh, community organizations and activists like myself have been able to provide accurate uh, current information for voters to be able to empower themselves and participate in the democratic process if we didn't have that if we didn't have the information that you provide and the assistance that you provide we would be open to intimidation misinformation and uh uh, the kinds of threats that we see evident across the country now and being able to stop people, especially people of color, from participating in the electoral process. So uh, I could go on and on and on about this, but the reality is that without the right to vote and without democracy and the processes that ACLU ensures are adhered to, um we'd be in a bit of trouble in the united states well thanks for that joe and i do want to pivot from there to talk a bit about the threats it's been wild watching this issue evolve over the years because i can remember when i was lobbying the legislature i did that from 2008 to 2017 and it was like voting rights mattered for about six months before the election and maybe a few months after the election and then everybody forgot about it, but now this has become a year round, uh, you know, every year, whether it's municipal year or a state and the federal year, the, the battles and debates over voting rights are real and they're constantly happening. So with that, you know, Vic and Mary and Joe mentioned that there are threats. So what threats are we facing when it comes to voting rights? 
Yeah. Hi. <laughs> hi, everybody. Vic Volchak, he, him pronouns, legal director, ACLU Pennsylvania. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is not only year round, it's constant. Here we are in a midterm election, and we have been in more than a half a dozen lawsuits over the past year already. Um, uh, and let me just say that, that, I mean, there's a ton going on. I would put the dangers into three buckets. One is kind of sowing doubt about the integrity of elections generally, you know, especially about 2020, because somebody's upset that they didn't win. Um, the second would be restricting voter access and actually minimizing votes. And the third is post-election kind of undermining of democracy. We call that threats to democracy. I'm just going to talk about the second and third real fast, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Marion. But, you know, the, the, the first big issue is that you've got a group of elected officials who are trying to prevent people from voting or minimize the number of people who can vote and minimize whose votes get counted. And so in 2019, there was an expansion of mail voting, which was super important during COVID. Um, and there was a, a uh, two lawsuits filed to actually say that that no excuse absentee voting was unconstitutional under the Pennsylvania Constitution. We participated, filed an amicus brief. Good news is Pennsylvania Supreme Court just a few weeks ago said, no, 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 rejected that challenge. So we have mail voting will continue. Anybody who wants to vote by mail is able to do so. But there was another problem that arose in 2020, and this is about whose votes get counted. And again, it's an attack on people who vote by mail. And this is whether or not people who, when they fill out their mail ballots and put it in the secrecy envelope and then the outer envelope, and then they have to sign the declaration saying this is who they are, they forget to put the date there. And uh, late last year after the 2021 election, uh, their uh, a candidate in Lehigh County for judge um, was arguing that uh, the uh, undated mail ballot voters should not be counted, went up through the state courts. You had a state court in January say that's right. You forget to put the date, which is completely meaningless. That ballot doesn't count. The ACLU jumped in, filed a federal court lawsuit um, and in May, the U.S. Third Circuit Court of Appeals said, you know what, that date means nothing. You cannot, under federal law, disenfranchise people because they forget the date. The vast majority of those people are senior citizens. We had two who were actually in their, in their, in their hundreds. That litigation actually led to more litigation to try to block people from voting in the McCormick Oz. There was, a, you know, McCormick was trying to argue that uh, undated ballots should be counted because he needed ballots, and that's, you know, all as a result of this Lehigh um, County case. The the last and and that and all of that is still ongoing. The last piece I want to want to get to is this threat to democracy, and we're seeing an early example of that, and that is that the um, you know group of Republican elected officials, they are all Republican. I am being descriptive here, um, are saying that because. Uh, of our decision, and it gets a little complicated, but they're saying because of our decision, you now have to throw out um, uh, mail ballots um, in there. And then there's another case also involving, they're saying we're not going to certify um, undated mail ballots. But let me turn it over to Marion to, to pick up from there. As you can see, there is a lot of litigation and we're still two months away from the election. Thanks, Vic. Hi, everybody. My name is Marianne Schneider. I'm the Senior Voting Rights Policy Council. I use she, her, hers pronouns. So the third bucket that Vic talked about was the efforts to sow doubt about the trustworthiness of our elections. And that is just driven primarily by this false narrative that the 2020 presidential race was fraudulent. Only the race for president, mind you, not any of the other races on the ballot. But this narrative has been embraced by the General Assembly especially the Senate, where the, an obscure committee called the Intergovernmental Operations Committee issued a subpoena to the Pennsylvania Department of State seeking uh, information in the name of investigating frauds. And so, of course, litigation over the legislative subpoena immediately ensued, and the ACLU of Pennsylvania intervened on behalf of voters because they were seeking the private information of all 
9 million Pennsylvania voters. Now we've successfully prevented any private information from being turned over. And we've also prevented a wholesale examination, a recount inspection like we saw in Arizona and Wisconsin, but that case is ongoing. And it's not limited to the General Assembly. These election denier groups are working in the counties and they're doing things like push, they're pushing this narrative and they're trying to, audit, you know, quote, audit. I use that term very loosely, um, the 2020 election. Um, and there are these aggressive claims of fraud are leading law enforcement officials to police locations where voters can return their mail ballots. Um, and this is all on top of the typical problems we try to mitigate, like voter intimidation at the polls, lack of language accessibility, aggressive requests for voter ID. But I'll turn quickly to the post-election threats. We learned in 2020 that it's not over on election day, as Trump filed a gazillion, <laughs> that's a real technical term, gazillion lawsuits um, about the election results. And so there is a list risk that the losing candidate and primarily the GOP candidate for governor, for example, refuses to accept the outcome. And though this time the election deniers are organizing in the counties and they're trying to gather the evidence, and I use that so-called evidence um, that was lacking last time. And they're recruiting volunteers who are limited or even non-existent knowledge of how elections really work. But the real risk that many are, are concerned about is that the election, that the county commissioners refused to certify the results. And we saw that just recently in the primary, the GOP primary, where four counties decided that they weren't going to certify results that included ballots where the voter forgot to write the date on the envelope. Now, they were ordered to do so recently on Friday. But this risk that counties arbitrarily decide not to certify the results or arbitrarily decide some ballots will be included and some ballots won't is a threat to undermining our democracy. And so with that, um, there's another, <laughs> another tactic that they use, which I'll ask Sarah to discuss. Hi, I am Sarah Mullen, Director of Advocacy and Policy, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, yes, we would be remiss if we didn't mention an ongoing or a newer threat that we are seeing for next next year, which is uh, a whole package of constitutional amendments. This is a new tactic that the legislature has been using to get around governor's veto. And one of the most worrying parts of this package, which was rammed through at the very last minute in July, um, it includes voter ID. So you know, we, we litigated voter ID 10 years ago and won, and so now they're going at it through the Constitution. So that is a really big concern for us. Um, this, the constitutional amendments are worthy of an entire call, if not multiple calls on their own, uh, so I won't spend too much time on them, but this, of course, package includes abortion bans, limits on executive orders. So this is not a threat for this fall's election, but we could see this on the ballot as soon as the next primary, so that is definitely a concern for us. And I would encourage folks to check out our social media platforms. We're on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, YouTube, all with the handles ACLUPA. We actually just posted an op-ed from one of our uh, allies at the New Pennsylvania Project about this very issue about these constitutional amendments. So um, we just posted that this morning so you can check that out. Um, but speaking of allies, um, you know, they're, the, the voting rights work is uh, vast. Um, and it's practically a cast of thousands, um, a lot of folks working in this space. And, and Sarah and Marion, um, you, you, the two of you and Vic have already talked a little bit about what the ACLU has done, but can you say a little more about how we, what, what kind of work we're doing to protect voting rights? Well, I'll, I'll start off with um, the Election Protection Coalition, of which ACLU is a member, and that's a national um a national coalition of nonprofit, nonpartisan groups that look to protect the right to vote and, and to actually troubleshoot problems in real time on election day. And the ACLU's role is um, we, we do two major parts of that. One is we recruit attorneys in all 67 counties of Pennsylvania who are familiar with their court system in the county in case we need someone to go into court and get an order to protect someone's right to vote on election day. But we also, in co with our coalition partners, um, staff the command center, which is a statewide um, troubleshooting and triage operation. And we get calls from 
voters, from people who are experiencing problems, but also from an extensive and robust field program that is bottom line by our partner, Common Cause Pennsylvania, um, who the field monitors go to the polling place, they try to help voters um, and they call us to help them. So this is a, a program that we try to troubleshoot problems in real time on election day and make sure no one is denied the right to vote when we can possibly help them. And I'll stop there and turn. Hi, uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what some of the other tactics that we're using. You know, we've been involved in the voting rights space forever. And as time has gone on, we've added different tactics. Um, as we've always done know your rights information, but we, I would say everything we're doing is sort of on steroids at this point. Um, but we really try to get our know your rights information. We do it in print, we do it online, we do it using social media platforms, we do it in video. We're always trying to figure out the best way to communicate with voters. We work really closely with grassroots groups who are the ones that are really in direct contact with um, with groups who are most likely to have their, their vote threatened and, and work with them closely on these. So we have the voter outreach around Know Your Rights materials. Um, some of the groups that we work with specifically are people with criminal convictions uh, that really dovetails with our criminal justice reform work. And so we work closely with grassroots groups on that. Um, we also have information for voters um, who are voting, who are trans voters. That is a, a, an ever-growing issue at the polls. And also because of vote by mail, there's a lot, it's a very complicated thing as people know, and the law is often changing, particularly in 2020, we saw that. So really trying to keep on top of that and be a source of really trusted information for our partners and for groups on the ground. We also have organized a voter ambassador program. So that's where we train up our volunteers and provide them accurate information that they can disseminate to their, to their uh, networks. And when people have questions or they had a problem last in 2020, you know, they weren't getting their mail and ballot didn't arrive, we could troubleshoot because we had this network built for people to help one-on-one um, -on -one with voters. We also do a lot of uh, speakers bureau work and particularly train the trainers. And so there's so many groups that have social service agencies, et cetera, that have a lot of contact with people um, that we don't have. So what we do is we go out to these groups and provide training what they need to know about voting rights. And then we are there constantly working with folks when they do experience an issue with one of their constituents. Um, these are sort of tactics that we've used in the past and are really growing, but I wanted to mention that we're in an unprecedented situation right now. And so I think we really have to focus on finding new ways to accomplish our work. I love our lawyers, the courts are really important, uh, but I think we're really seeing that we need to get people mobilized and organized. And so I think that a lot of that work begins at the county level. Um, there are a lot of these counties that as we've heard are really ready to overturn elections. And the problem is the people showing up and yelling at election directors and yelling at county commissioners um, are people who wanna undermine the election. We need to get our folks and people who really believe in democracy to be out there in equal force and show we can't let this, them walk all over us and just let this happen. It feels like watching a slow motion car wreck in a lot of ways, and we have to get our folks out there, even in places where we don't have a lot of members, um, because people in Philadelphia and people in Pittsburgh, where our greatest strengths are, number-wise, they're not going to be able to save us. We need to get everybody across the state out there. So we are launching a new project, which you'll hear more about it in the coming days, the Democracy Defense Campaign. And that is really focused on organizing at the county level in places where we've never organized before, working in partnership with groups on the ground. Part of that also is um, another project we've launched, which is the transparency project that we do with All Voting is Local. And that's really about keeping an eye on what's going on in these county commissioner meetings. 67 counties, our staff is, cannot you know, track everything that they are going, you know, that's going on at these but really important stuff is happening at these meetings. Counties getting rid of drop boxes, counties passing resolutions undermining the results of the election, um, counties talking about having DAs, people, officers at drop boxes to try to catch people who are putting more than one ballot in the drop box, those sorts of things. So we have recruited volunteers in these local places to keep an eye on what's going on, go to these meetings, watch them online and report back to us what's going on. So those are some of our, our initiatives that we're working on. Well, that, that segues into, uh, I wanted to ask you, Sarah and Joe, both about this collaborative work and what the, like how it's structured, who are we talking about? Like there, there are multiple levels to all of this. And I mean, it really is 
daily. I mean, this work is happening daily. So I was wondering if the two of you can can talk a little bit about how all these community partners, including the ACLU, are collaborating together. And Joe, why don't you go ahead and start? Uh, uh, one of the things that um, that our organization does, and, and by the way, um, uh, on on screen uh, you see a name Jemandari Sertain, and Jemandari is a Swahili word for commander, and quite frankly, it's a um, it's a title that I earned uh, a long time ago as as a field organizer and tactical commander in the field for voting rights, voter registration, um, and voter protection activities. And I'm still involved in that now. The, we partner with the ACLU, uh, especially uh, with the assistance of, of Sarah and the um, information uh, support and backup of Marion personally uh to make sure that our members are armed with the correct information to be able to go into the field and uh quite frankly defend the right to vote which means that what we want to do is make sure that in the areas uh of the commonwealth where people of color are concentrated um in voting jurisdictions and we've identified um, 18 jurisdictions in 16 counties in the Commonwealth where uh, people of color are uh, uh, very influential in the uh, uh, the voting blocks of that particular county. We try to make sure that there are uh, attorneys of color and activists and organizers on the ground to be able to make sure that voters, especially voters of color, are not intimidated, that poor people are not overwhelmed with false information and uh, 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 misinformation, uh, or intimidated in any way to stop them from voting. So we are involved in voter registration, but that's only a part of it because once people are registered, they have to go to the polls and many, many voters are intimidated when they go into the polling place, especially if they've never done it before. We try to reassure those people and empower them and give them the confidence that they need to step into the polling place and feel empowered enough to be able to cast their vote for the candidates that they choose. Um, we uh, like to fight fire with fire. Now, nobody else on this call is gonna say this, but we are fully prepared to meet intimidation um, and the intimidators on our own terms in the field, uh, which is not something that's sanctioned by ACLU or Common Cause or anybody else, but it's something that we know we have to do in order to maintain the, uh, the right to vote. It's not something that's new for us. I've been doing it for quite a while, a long time. And there are many people who work with me who've been doing this for uh, years. And from time to time, we do have to physically confront people who are trying to um, stop people of color uh, and any other voter uh, from casting their vote uh, on election day. Uh, there are not enough people at ground level willing to jump into the fray uh, uh, from the field perspective and assist the attorneys. You can't send attorneys into the field without the kind of support and sometimes protection that they need to be able to do their job effectively. And one of the things that we do is try to provide that field support for attorneys um, and other people who are helping us um, maintain the right to vote. So that's what the OV Caddo uh, Voter Empowerment Initiative is all about. And um, there's a lot more to it, but essentially that's what we do. And Joe, I want to come back to you in a few minutes about, about your organization. But Sarah, I also was hoping you could chime in. And you started to say a little bit the last in your last answer, but say a bit about the ACLU's collaborative work with our community partners. Sure, uh, but first I just wanna say, 
how much I admire Joe and how he has been a very good reminder for me personally uh, when I get down about the state of our country and where we are, particularly in voting rights. And Joe's like, you got to keep on going. And I've been through worse and we just have to keep moving. So it's been really, really great working with Joe on these things. Um, as Yes, we do our work collaboratively. There's just too much that happens right now. We we're, we have to work collaboratively and our re everybody's resources are thin. And so we really the voting space is one of the most collaborative spaces that I've been in, um, and our our people working on this and groups working on this have grown. Well, you know, when we first, when I first got involved over ten years ago in voting rights specifically, it was a small core of us. You know, your usual suspects, Common Cause, League of Women Voters. You know, Joe was around, and and just a smaller group. But that has grown. Um, groups that don't focus primarily on voting rights are really involved. Uh, groups that work um, with people who uh, you know, immigrants. Um, people with disabilities, all these groups have gotten involved in the voting space, um, which has been really important. We have national partners have grown uh, and gotten involved and we have hyper-local uh, groups as well in Philadelphia, some groups that work with just a very small community. And so that's been really gratifying um, because that really informs our work is we're not always on the grassroots. So that's been really helpful um, and also to distribute the work. So I will say it does require a heck of a lot of Zoom meetings for planning and coordinating everybody, but it is so important to this work. They also bring different skills. We have folks that are like us that are in the legal arena. We have organizing people who are really primarily about voter contact and um, people who are in some of these rural areas where they can get folks out. We have an amazing group uh, that works up in Luzerne County as well, really putting pressure on the local government there. I think it's also really important that groups like ours that are pretty well resourced in this space really work with groups like Joe's that are run on a shoestring budget. And so we really do try to provide resources, print materials, just really work closely in providing uh, both people power and um, money resources, materials, all of that thing for groups um, that work with people who are traditionally in danger of having them, their votes not counted. And at the risk of you know, just continue throwing more information at folks. I just want to point out that on our website, ACO, there's a page dedicated to voting rights. Um, and to Sarah's point about having materials available, aclupa.org slash vote. And then from there, there are links to different topics. Um, so definitely encourage folks to check that out. There are some material, there are like some printed home materials. So if you had a reason to use a paper version, you can print it at home. And then we also have, we, we, we will be having um, professionally printed materials that you can um, ask for by contacting us at vote at aclupa.org. Um, Joe, I wanted to come back to your, your, your organization though. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Octavius Caddo and why he's important to your organization and to the people of Philadelphia? How much time do you have? <laughs> uh, a few minutes, go ahead. <laughs> uh, 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 Obi Caddo was a, um, a Philadelphia activist, intellectual. Um, he was a... Um, a military commander at one point in Pennsylvania. He was active in the uh, uh, early and mid 19th century. Um, he was a contemporary of um, uh, Frederick Douglass and, and others uh, who were involved in getting black men the right to vote. Initially, the right to vote was only given to men and uh, Obi Kato was one of the organizers and activists, uh, besides doing a lot of other things, who worked diligently to get black men to participate in the first opportunity there was to vote uh, in Pennsylvania, and that was in 1871. And as a result of that, uh, while he was still a young man, uh, he had a, um, a big reputation and had it been involved for a long time in activism, uh, especially here in Philadelphia County. As a result of his activity on October 10th, 1871, um, he was shot down near his home uh, doing his work on election day uh, in the first election for black men in Philadelphia or in Pennsylvania. So our organization is named in his honor to carry on and maintain his legacy um, to not only get people registered to vote, but to continue participation in the electoral process and to protect the right to vote. 
it's essential that um, we are as prepared as he was to make sure that the right to vote is not put in jeopardy uh, or neutralized by anyone uh, who doesn't want to see it happen. And uh, quite frankly, that's about what we do in a nutshell. And that's who Obi Keto was. Thanks, Joe. It's, you know, it's really inspiring and really appreciate all the work that you're doing. And, and th that segues to what is always the last question on a panel like this. I'm going to direct it to both of you, Joe and Sarah. What can people do if people want to be supportive, if they're passionate about voting rights? What can they do to get involved in their communities to protect the right to vote? Sarah, so I'll let you go first. Oh, thanks, Joe. Um, well, as we said, this is an unprecedented moment. We really need all hands on deck. And I know it's very easy to get depressed about where we are in this, but I think I can say the fighting back and really finding a way to do that meaningfully is really helpful um, and, and keeping going. So we do have a lot of opportunities. We are part of a coalition working on recruiting poll workers. There's a big shortage of poll workers in many areas. Um, we also have the election protection program that Marion talked about where people go out in the field. This is Common Cause runs the field for this, but we help recruit volunteers. And on election day, they go around to a set um, number of um, polling places and are there to help voters and make sure everything's going well there and report back to us uh, if there are any problems. We do need volunteer attorneys in across the Commonwealth. Um, we try to recruit a volunteer for every county. Um, some counties, we have a ton of volunteer attorneys, um, but there are counties out there where we don't really have anyone. And so if you're, especially if you're an attorney in a rural area or know someone, um, that would be great to add to our list of people who uh, can go into court on election day if there's a problem and go right into court and get that fixed. Um, also, understandably, with COVID, there are a lot of people who are comfortable leaving their house to do some of these in-person things. Common Cause also runs a social media monitor program, so they do training, and that way we can find out through Twitter, et cetera, what's going on, what might need our help. Um, I mentioned the Voter Ambassador Program, and by the way, we will be posting links to all of these resources, so this is just an overview, but you'll, you'll have time to digest and think about all these and how to do that. As I mentioned, we also are putting speakers out there, train the trainer program. So if you're with a community group of any kind, we'd be happy to set up a, a speaking engagement to talk about voting rights. Um, there's also that transparency project that I mentioned and then distributing our know your rights information. So those are just a number of ways. And I am sure that Joe has other ways people can get involved. Yeah, you know, there are other things that, uh, that we do uh, uh, in conjunction with what uh, Sarah just outlined. And that is we try to make sure that every voter, uh, new seasoned voter, uh, uh, community-based voters especially, uh, who need information that's accurate and current, get access to that information so that they feel empowered when they go to the polling place. We don't want anybody walking up to a polling place or voting by mail who may feel intimidated by the process itself or confused about the ballot. So we try to emphasize going back to basics to make sure that everybody knows, first of all, what their rights are as individual voters and also what the requirements are for being able to cast your ballot and the regulations uh, involved in voting, what you can and can't do and what people cannot do to you so that you feel empowered uh, as a voter in Pennsylvania to go to the polling place and encourage others to do the same. Um, one of the things that we're involved in right now uh, is the Pennsylvania Coalition in Defense of Democracy. And what we are about to launch um, is a, a, uh, a statewide uh, effort, knock on wood, uh, that will uh, allow us to set up workshops and uh, 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 seminars in, in community locations around the Commonwealth, especially in those targeted areas that I uh, talked about earlier in those 18 jurisdictions and the 16 counties. But it's also uh, to provide at venues like churches and 
community organizations and uh, um, uh, uh, activist organizations uh, the opportunity for voters to come in and learn what it is they need to know and what it is they need to do in order to share information about voting and to um, educate their friends, neighbors, and families about why it's important to maintain uh, democracy and the right to vote in Pennsylvania and not to be intimidated or otherwise uh, 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 fall victim to disenfranchisement uh, by people who are really set on making sure that people of color do not vote in Pennsylvania. That's what this is. And that's what it has been for years. It's the same thing that happened during the civil rights movement and before that. That's why Obi Kato was assassinated. It has not stopped. It's been going on since 1871. And we are the 21st century continuation of his legacy. So I want to pivot into the Q and A section and just remind folks that if you will finish, we'll finish our, our webinar today with some questions from, from folks that are listening in and and watching. Um, I just want to remind everybody that if you have a question, feel free to use the the question and answer function, the Q and A at the bottom of the the toolbar there on on your Zoom screen, or use the chat, um, or you can email us at donate at aclupa.org. I, I noticed that a couple of my colleagues have. I've answered a few of the questions uh, in the Q&A section. Um, and Marion, I wanted to, I see that you're typing an answer, but I wanna actually ask you this live because we can have a little bit of a discussion. Um, uh, several of you have talked about like some of this threat of intimidation at the polls. And there's a question here about, you know, some more specifics about what kinds of polling place disenfranchisement tactics we think we could be seeing this year. So thanks, Andy. Um, I think one thing that we saw in 2021 and even in not so much in the primary, but in the general 2021 is more voter intimidation or um, kind of presence presence at the polling place of uh, election uh, law enforcement, some of the election deniers who are, um, you know, I'll say vocal <laughs> um, and uh, trying to uh, intimidate voters. And we did get some calls on that. The other thing is because we have had some changes, what, one of the things that we're seeing is that this information, there's a lot of dis and misinformation um, and it causes a lot of confusion. And not only does it cause confusion among voters, but it even causes some confusion among poll workers. And so some of the disenfranchisement can be directly tied to spreading false narratives about how elections are supposed to work and what's fraud and trying to prevent people from voting because you're afraid that there's a fraudulent vote. So um, we'll, I'm sure we'll also see aggressively asking voters for voter ID, especially in some of the communities that Joe was mentioning, um, where there are attempts to prevent voters of color from exercising their fundamental right to vote. Um, but, you know, we didn't, in 2020, we were worried, we were worried about roving bands of, um, so, you know, some of these like Oath Keepers, those kinds of folks, we did not see any of that in 2020, um, thankfully. And I, um, but that doesn't mean that they there isn't that risk. But generally, uh, we don't see that kind of we don't see actual violence at our polling locations, and hope that continues. I don't know. I think Sarah might have some other thoughts on this. I'm sorry, I was distracted answering questions in the Q and A. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I was just going to open it up to I don't know if Joe or Vic, um, if either of you. Well, one of the things. On, yeah, one ahead. of the things that um, uh, just to add on to what Marion was saying, uh, even though we don't anticipate that kind of activity, we try to be prepared for it at all times. Um, in Philadelphia, especially uh, in Philadelphia County, even a city is, in a city as densely populated uh, as we are, there have been attempts to go into specific voting precincts in Philadelphia and try to intimidate voters. 
Um, so it's not always rural or suburban uh, or uh, out of the way places where people try to intimidate or stop people from, vote, from voting. It happens in the larger jurisdictions and in the major metropolitan areas also. The key thing is to be armed with the right information to make sure that the voters feel empowered and confident enough to uh, go to the polls and do what they know they need to do, and then to back them up and to back up the attorneys that may need to be called in response to a problem that we're having at a polling place. We try to make sure that nobody is alone on election day from the perspective of feeling um, helpless in the face of disenfranchisement or intimidation, misinformation or disinformation. And um, the we try to act as a force multiplier in areas where uh, we know that there may need to be a response that's not in the books for what needs to happen uh, on election day to protect uh, registered voters. Um, I Andy, thought there was a, oh, go ahead, Vic. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add that the, you know, the potential issues are not just intimidation outside the polls. I mean, there's another problem that we have seen in the past where, you know, each party um, is allowed to send in kind of poll monitors into the polling places. Um, and they can, to, you know, for lack of a better term, gum up the works in there, like challenge voters excessively. And what that does is slow everything down. And then you have lines. And, you know, some people are trying to vote when they get a break at work and they only have so much time. And if they have to wait two or three hours, they're not going to be able to vote. Um, and that is a problem that we've, as I said, we've seen in the past and one that we are anticipating again um, uh, this election and, and in the future. But that's another way to disenfranchise people. If you make it take so long to vote, they're not going to be able to vote. Go ahead, Mary. Uh, one other thing that because now with universal mail in voting, we have some a whole other set of issues that we didn't have in the past. So one thing that we're seeing is, and this is also driven by the big lie, false narrative, is uh, overly aggressive law enforcement around places where voters drop off their mail ballots because uh, there's this a, a false narrative that there's a lot of ballot harvesting when the, what people mean by that is that uh ballots are being delivered by pe by people more more than one ballot is being delivered by one person under pennsylvania law you're really supposed to only drop off your own ballot that um so uh we saw the da in um lehigh county make a lot of noise about they were going to prosecute people who dropped off ballots that weren't theirs and um, you know, this is just uh, efforts to dissuade people from using universal mail balloting, which has turned out to be an enormously popular and convenient method of voting. And uh, there are protections to detect and prevent fraud, and, and those protections are in the election code, but that is never really discussed by the election deniers. So. That's another way that people are being uh, kind of dissuaded from voting. Um, I see a couple of things in the chat that I wanted to, in the Q&A that I wanted to address. One is um, a question uh, from Susan from Power Interfaith about having Sarah and Joe come and speak. So um, I, I will defer to Sarah and Joe on whether or not, the, or when, when they can be available, but um, definitely would encourage folks to be in touch with us if there are places where we can be to help voters and, and know their rights and, and ensure that they um, understand uh, the election protection efforts that are out there. Um, definitely encourage folks to be in touch with us. Um, it, Sarah, we're using vote at aclupa.org to have them get in touch, correct? Sure. I'm also just been dropping my email into the into the chat to make sure I can follow up with folks. But yeah, okay, either way, excellent. we'll get that. Excellent. And then I see a question here about information on rules and laws. Um, again, you know, the, the, our, our website um, 
our, our voting rights page, aclupa.org slash vote has a lot of information for a whole range of voters, whether they are, you know, there's, there's a, a section about language access for voters who, uh, for whom English is not their most comfortable language. Um, there's information about people with criminal convictions. Um, there is information for people who um, have disabilities. So definitely uh, encourage you to check that out, aclupa.org slash vote. And Joe, think, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking, um, can yeah. you tell us where folks can go to learn more about uh, the Caddo Voter Empowerment Initiative? Uh, we don't have a website up now, but um, if they try to reach the OB Caddo uh, uh, Voter Empowerment Initiative, uh, uh, I am very comfortable with people reaching out to uh, uh, Sarah or uh, uh, Marion through the uh, ACLU, uh, especially locally. Uh, and my my um, my personal email is jsertain at gmail dot com. Uh, if folks want to try and get a hold of me by email, I respond to any inquiries and. Uh, that's about it. I also wanted to come back. I saw a question in the chat as well about the constitutional amendments, which Sarah talked about a little bit, and Vic pro pro provided a helpful link um, to spotlight about that. I do want to just kind of like give an overview of this process because it is important for folks to understand that these, these are state constitutional amendments related to one would um, declare that abortion is not, there's no constitutional right to abortion in our state constitution. One is a strict voter ID requirement that would require an unexpired government issued ID. There is an amendment that would make it much easier for the legislature to overturn regulations. Um, the lieutenant governor would no longer be an elected position. It would be appointed uh, by the gubernatorial candidate. Um, and then there is one more on the oversight of elections, shifting it to the auditor general. The process here is to amend the Pennsylvania Constitution, the legislature has to pass identical language in back-to-back -back sessions. So they've already passed it once, that was this year, meaning that and the, the, there, a new session starts in January, so they would have to pass it a second time. And once that happens, then it goes to the voters where it needs to pass with a simple majority. So this is all brewing right now in the legislature. Our, our preference is to... Um, is to stop all of this in the legislature. And you're gonna see us, you're gonna see a whole bunch of organizations getting involved in what we are, the working title is the vote no campaign. We're, we're just saying vote no on everything. Um, <laughs> we, we, as you might imagine, we're particularly focused on um, the abortion language and on the voter ID language. Um, there are a lot of groups that are very passionate about the regulation uh, constitutional amendment. Um, so be on the lookout for information from us and from our allies about this over the coming months. Um, the earliest that they could vote that second time is mid to late January when the legislature comes back. Um, but the ideal here is to stop this um, before it even gets to the ballot. And I, having said that, I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in on constitutional amendments. I see some shaking of heads, so that's good. Okay. Um, well, thank you all very much. This has been a very informative conversation. I want to thank our members again for, for being with us um, for this full hour. Um, there's tons of information, and it's all very helpful. Obviously, we have a battle on our hands, um, but it's worth it. Um, it's worth it to defend our democracy. So Mary and Vic, Sarah, Joe, thank you. Thank you all for, for your time and your expertise. And Sarah Johnson, I'm going to hand it back to you. Yes, thank you. Wow, what a rich discussion. I um, appreciate uh, all the panelists. And of course, again, thank you to those in the, the space and, and all those great questions. If we missed anything, we'll be sure to, to follow up. And you can always reach out um, with anything that might come, come to mind and, and follow up. So again, thank you, Reggie, uh, Andy, Sarah, Marion, Vic, and of course, Joe, um, for being with us today. Uh, extra huge thanks to Sam Jen, who's been behind the scenes, keeping us organized and running all of the tech. Um, you know, we always welcome feedback and follow up. You'll get an email from us with a survey 
Um, Sam may be posting a, a link in the chat as well. But lastly, and, and certainly not leastly, thanks again um, to all of you uh, for joining us today to, to learn um, in community um, and for everything you're doing out there in, in the streets uh, to advance this work. We, again, can't do it without you. So, um, you know, I am the director of philanthropy, so I'd certainly be remiss if, if I didn't say uh, if you enjoyed today's discussion and are able to consider a gift, you know, please um, visit us online, aclupa.org slash donate to make a donation. Um, and of course, uh, check out the various ways to get involved. Um, with that, we will end the call for today. Thanks everyone, uh, be well, and I wish you a, a good rest of your day. So thank you. Bye.